All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's Candid Shop Talk is going to be a world without trade shows. I'm here with Candid co-founder Avery Bloom. Um, Hello. A bit of a history in all of this, and we're going to be talking about uh, in broad strokes and then increasingly narrow strokes, um, sort of the past, present, and future of trade shows and, and you know, the story of the day, of course, which is the COVID-19 pandemic super virus that has us all inside and is, you know, has so many dimensions to it, but not least of which it's very disruptive towards trade shows and a lot of businesses depend on trade shows for their livelihood. And I'm fascinated to hear some of your thoughts on this. Great. Looking forward to you're talking trade shows. So Avery, what's your, what's your background in terms of, are you a brand? Are you a retailer? Yes. Um, so in addition to Candid, you can see my background here is actually the upstairs of our shuttered retail store. Uh, I started an apparel company called North of West with my wife in, I don't know, about 10 years ago. Uh, and we have a retail store in downtown Portland. So over the years, we've done basically everything you can do. We started out uh, producing clothing in, in a kind of our little micro factory underneath the stage in an art gallery <laughs> um, and built that out into a, a 4,000 square foot factory. Um, and so I've done everything from uh, slinging clothes at, a, at, um, at trade shows like um, Magic and whatnot in Los Angeles. And, uh, Las Vegas and New York and uh, all the way down to selling stuff at street fairs and tiny little events. So I've, I've really been through the, the every side of it. We buy at trade shows, sell at trade shows, have a retail store, whole nine yards. Awesome. So, so yeah, let's, let's kind of walk, walk through like roll by roll. I want to know what, what a trade show means for your business. Um, I know a lot, you know, for me, when I think of trade shows, I think, you know, it's all, I, for some reason, I think like the 50s. Like, I just think of, of Don Draper looking guys in their polyester suits kind of getting drunk in hotels at night and just <laughs> philandering on the floors of, of a trade show. I realize that's completely out of date. Um, but it seems, I mean, but the point being is that it seems like this sort of ancillary thing that is, is used, you know, for a very specific sort of door-to-door -door salesman type. And I know that's, that's not true, especially in the apparel industry. Um, so what does it what does it look like? Typically, a brand is going to be showing, and a retailer is going to be attending. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So, in general, brands or showrooms or reps um, are you know they have, they take all of their goods, and and I really specifically um, know the world of apparel and home goods, um, and I had you know so things look a little bit different when you're in, for instance, like specialty foods or something like that. Yeah. Um, but in general, you've got your the person who's doing the selling has got a booth. They have all their their wares um, in apparel. It's very seasonal, so you're going to have your spring, summer, um, and your or your fall, winter, and those are going to be the goods that you're going to be pre-selling uh, for delivery in around six months. Um, that's that's quite a bit different um, from other industries, but that's how it goes, particularly in apparel. Um, really, what you're doing is, there's different pieces to it. One is, and I think this is perhaps the most important thing. Um, is to cultivate and manage the relationships with your customers, with your retailers. Um, wholesale, around 90% of wholesale is reorders. So that means that maintaining and managing your existing relationships is one of the most important things that you can do. And it can seem a little bit dull or tiresome, but at a trade show, you know, folks are walking around uh, and you see your vendors and it's really just in the, in the old days, <laughs> a few months ago, uh, kind of high-fiving and saying, checking in, seeing how you are, seeing how everybody's doing, um, and just building a rapport because things are going to come up. You're, someone's going to have trouble with shipping. A product's going to break. A, a, someone's going to have an issue. Someone's going to love the product and want more. Whatever that is, um, you're going to be dealing with it, and you need to – that dealing with it means that you're going to be relying on the relationship and building on that uh, to get through whatever troubles you end up having in, in the process. Um, and really – you think about it, who are you going to do business with? And it's going to be the people that you like and the people that you want to do business with, particularly now um, where it feels almost like a political act to spend a dollar. Um, you're going to want to put those dollars where you'll think they'll do the most good. Um, and that's going to be with the suppliers and with the retailers that you like doing business with. 
So part of the trade show is, you know, of course, the, the selling aspect, actually writing orders. Um, and a lot of that is always, you know, used to be done on paper. Um, and I think a lot of it's moving online. Before it used to be around 90, 95% of orders actually got written at shows. Um, and now it's closer to 40, 50%. Um, folks take all their orders, they go home, look everything over um, and, uh, and write their orders and send them in over a digital platform or unfortunately over email, which gets to be quite a mess. <laughs> and don't forget the fax machine. No, oh, God. Cocktail napkin. <laughs> <laughs> and then... some, of our, some of our candid users um, <laughs> sent, me, sent me screenshots of basically people texting in orders, which if you do this, you know what? I, I, I get it. It's 2020, but um, it's a really difficult way to do business. So basically like texting in orders, hey, can I have like 50 more of those cups? And you're like, who are you? <laughs> what, <laughs> what cups? Um, and so, and we definitely have, I had to set up, I remember it was a year or two ago and we had to set up a whole fax line thing just so that we could receive faxes. Um, the way that, you know, truth is, is that retailers and brands, some folks have been in business for a really long time and they like, you know, they've done business the same way for a really long time. Um, and so they, they do it that way. Um, I think there, we're definitely seeing the need to improve those processes over time, particularly now. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so so it sounds like it's 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 interesting. It's it's sort of like a watering hole. It's it's the place where you go to see and be seen and and put faces to names. Um, do you have a sense of like how much how much of that how much of the value that you've seen in trade shows and that, that you've heard people talk about from trade shows on both the brand and the retailer side? How much of that is about kind of expanding your existing network versus strengthening the ties that are already there? Yeah, um, in any given season, statistically, people will grow anywhere between 10 to 20%. That's kind of what you should expect to see um, year over year. Um, and so the vast majority are going to be reorders. And so building those networks and, and maintaining them are important. But there, are other, there are a couple of other important things um, to keep in mind. Of course, the new orders are going to feel the most exciting. Um, managing the existing relationships is probably the most important thing. Um, because, but it's not like retailers don't know that they're going to keep on working with people. So when yeah. they really have to consider carefully um, who they start working with, because they're going to probably be working with them in two, three, four, five seasons. Um, also, if you think about, you know, what what is the value of acquiring a new customer, the first time they order, um, that's the first part of the ROI. But over over time, uh, the return on investment of actually acquiring a new customer is going to be many times that assuming that you can retain that customer so really investing in uh, the relationship is what gets you the most out of your initial spend trying to get new customers um, one thing that's really easy to to lose track of though and I think this is just like what's going on in general is that the it's 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 really important to acquire new customers um, but the question is at what cost? And so I, I think I'm sure we'll cover this, but you know, trade shows have always been a difficult uh, road to hoe it, when the math doesn't work out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, before we, <clears throat> excuse me, before we get into that one, one more question. So we've talked about brands, we've talked about retailers. There's a third entity sort of like, you know, animal, vegetable, mineral um, showrooms who are, <laughs> you know, I, I, they're, they're neither brand nor retailer, but they are the connector between the two. And I think mm -hmm. they, in my experience, they tend to exhibit more of the, more of the traits of a brand than a retailer, but, but where do they fit in the mix? Yeah. So reps or showrooms, um, they can have different relationships with, with the folks that they're working for, but they're essentially an external sales agency um, whose only purpose in life is to sell wholesale to retailers. So they've got their stable of brands that they work with. Um, they often have a territory, and they'll sometimes they'll attend trade shows on behalf of those companies um, and they'll essentially host a booth let's say with instead of one or two they might have uh, 10 brands or 20 brands that are all in the same place and it's it's nice because um, they're sort of pre-curating for the retailers so retailers come to trust those showrooms or reps um, to know the kinds of folks that they might want to work with um, it means that you're at a certain stage in your business if you're working with a rep um, reps get paid on commission, so that means that you have to be moving a certain amount of volume where it doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense 
for them to spend a bunch of time, a uh, bunch of time selling your brand. Um, yeah. There's, there's a little bit of a tension between brands and reps always because brands have a tremendous amount of work to do to just produce, to produce the, their lines, to design everything, to manage everything, to produce, every, you know, to get, to get it all over the finish line. And then the reps are actually just selling. Um, and so there's always a tension around fees and what exactly it's worth. And the truth is, is that their reps have a really important role to play, particularly for businesses at certain scales. One thing I learned over the years is that not every business works at every scale. How many wholesale dollars would you need to be selling uh, to pay for one inside wholesale rep or one inside sales person? Um, somebody who's works just for your company is trying to sell wholesale all day. Um, if they're, let's just say your margin is 50%, so on $100, you make $50. Um, you got to pay for somebody's $60,000 salary, you got to sell $120,000 of wholesale just to pay for their salary. So if you were to, um, to instead, so if, if they were to so you hire someone new, they come in, sell $120,000 their first year, you've essentially made no money, but paid for all the production and, and had been short on cash that entire time. Um, they would need to produce an excess of their own, um, their own salary in wholesale dollars profit. Um, where a rep comes in is in this spot between, um, between where it doesn't make sense to have your own inside salespeople because wholesale is not a big enough part of your business. Um, and to bridge that gap and grow the company to a point where it might make sense to have one or two or three or four people um, at the point at which you're selling, you know, several million dollars of wholesale a year. And, uh, and, and essentially the rep, because they're so specialized, can do that service, provide it for a number of companies, um, and really just specialize and, and move everybody forward. Nice. Um, so, so what do the reps and showrooms specifically do at the trade shows? Do they, do they have like a booth? Do they kind of flit around? Do they yeah. sit them out entirely? They, um, in general, they're going to have a booth just like a brand. Um, and so they're going to be hosting their booth, but with a whole bunch of brands lined up on their, um, on their racks. And so there can be a, a, any number of different folks. And one of the benefits that, that a, a rep works with, uh, is, is dealing with is that because they're in the business for so long, their relationships with retailers are most of the time reorders in one way or another. Maybe they worked with them a few years ago with one line, they come back for another one. And so there's, there is that, that kind of background relationship uh, that they build on to, um, uh, to help boost the sales process. Um, now that may or may not be a replacement for a brand having their own presence. Um, there's kind of, there's nothing better than uh, being able to, talk about your product. If you're, if you're the owner of a retail or of a, of a brand, um, no one's going to be able to sell it like you. Let's just be real. Like, you know, your product, you're passionate about your product. You essentially are the embodiment of it in certain ways. And so you're going to be able to do the best, um, the best version of that. Uh, but reps can play a, a, a really su healthy supporting role when you get to a certain point. Fantastic. Um, Okay, so I'm I'm going to be leading the witness here a little bit. But full disclosure: we we sell software that helps people sell, buy and sell wholesale, and we've been working at this for quite a while. Um, but the the big question for you is: it, prior to the COVID nineteen pandemic, um, what was your sense of how trade shows were were doing? Were they holding steady? Were they ascendant? Were they things people were starting to back off from as new technological alternatives arose? A great question. Um, personally, I actually have a there. I have some some sour opinions of trade shows because there's a tremendous amount of cost that goes into them um, that really can erode your margin significantly. And so, from the brand perspective, for a for the trade show themselves, they're the ones who are making money. And I don't necessarily think that a lot of the retailers um, or brands who are showing there are necessarily making a tremendous amount um, by actually getting to the going to these events. Um, and I think that there were there are tendencies to to rely on them because that's the way the business was always done. But 
unfortunately, you know, things are things are uh, are moving in the direction where the trade show is not going to be a necessary middleman. And I think that we're hopefully getting to a point where trade shows might still play a role, but it'll be diminished. Um, if you're going to, let's just say you spend $20,000 uh, at a trade show and you acquire a certain number of customers, $20,000 in trade show, uh, in trade shows, plus let's say travel and whatever, let's say that's two shows, it's another $6,000. So $26,000, that's the equivalent of $50,000 of product sold. So is a trade show better than giving away $50,000 of product? Um, if you were just to, to take that, you know, the first, the first 50,000 that goes out the door, you'd be like, you might as well, or the first 25 of that, you can just ship it out the door for free. Is that going to acquire more customers or not? It's a little bit difficult to tell. I would generally think that it's, it can be a pretty difficult road to hoe. Um, and I think that what we're dealing with right now with COVID, I mean, the Jacob Javits Center, which is one of the, the kind of key uh, key places in the apparel world, they're actually now a field hospital. So that sort of changes the math on, um, on whether or not the trade show is going to be something I particularly am interested in attending. Um, and as we progress, I think that there are going to be better ways to acquire customers at lower cost. Um, and then the key is going to be maintaining and building those relationships uh, after the fact in ways that are less expensive. I like that answer. Um, yeah, I pulled up an infographic that I found at a bizpronet.com. I have no idea what this website is, but I saved the image. Um, it's just a breakdown of trade show costs showing what, what exactly that means. You know, and a third of it is booth space. You've got big chunks for travel, um, exhibit design and construction, shipping, show services, all this, all this stuff that, that again, as you say, you have to, you know, given, given average margins, you have to spend at least, you have to make at least twice that just to break even and have it not, have made more sense for you to stay home. Um, okay, so <laughs> you know where this is headed, the meat in the sandwich. Um, we are, you know, Social distancing is upon us. We now have at every level, you know, as of the end of April, 2020, I, I, almost every state in the union has very firm stay at home orders, gatherings of more than, than you know, in some places, 10 people are, are straight up illegal. Um, this is obviously having a huge, huge effect on trade shows. And, and we've got a calendar that we host at candidwholesale.com that where we're tracking all the different trade shows. Um, Right now, everything, I mean, everything through May is just canceled. And I think some, some people haven't canceled the ones in June yet, but I will be very surprised. Even, even if we begin some rudimentary reopening of society, the extent to which that's just not gonna be the kind of activity people wanna be doing, traveling from all over the world to congregate in an enclosed space with recirculating air for days at a time and then flying back to your communities is like, you know, the probably literally the worst thing you could be doing during a pandemic. So. Assuming those are going to be gone for a while, um, what what are the alternatives? Like, what what would you do, knowing what you know about the life cycle, um, you know, as a brand, as a retailer, what would you be doing right now, without trade shows? Yeah, um, you'll be shocked to hear that uh, one of the best <laughs> things you can do <laughs> is set up an alternative. I mean, of, of course, we happen to have uh, a platform that supports your existing sales efforts um, and helps retailers discover you. That's important because basically right now, the way that you wanted to do business before is, is going to be on hold, if, if, at least for now and maybe indefinitely. Um, what and how and in which way trade shows come back to life, I don't really know. Um, but I think that when they do, it's going to be different. And I don't really see that this is going to have just a, sh a short-term effect. So looking down the road, what are the ways that, you know, uh, trade shows were essentially a channel to sell wholesale. What are other channels that you can approach uh, to do the two most important things, which is build and maintain your relationship with your existing customers and give them a, a confident, but not extremely expensive way to purchase those products. And on top of that, uh, find new ways to actually reach out to connect with new retailers. Um, and th the truth is, is that we have competitors in space. You know, there's Fair, there's Bulletin, there's um, Brand Boom, New Order, Jor. These are all ways that you can use the internet <laughs> to bridge this gap between you and retailers. Um, 
And if you're a retailer and you're listening to this right now, um, you're going to be needing to discover new brands. Some of the people that you've been working with for years are going to go out of business and it's tragic and it's going to be extremely painful for a lot of people. Um, but that's going to happen. And, and the place in your stores that you were holding for them may be opening up. And so discovering new brands and using that as an opportunity uh, to reintroduce yourself to your customers, your direct to consumer, um, that this is a moment for that. And finding new retail, new brands that you want to work with, um, that you can work with long term, that are using platforms that uh, make the purchasing process transparent, uh, efficient, clear, and can help you all the way through. That's something that you need to start looking at. And um, and candidate happens to be a, a pretty good place for all those things. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think we've one thing that we've talked about a lot internally that I'm just going to put up on the on the board here because I think it's worth sharing. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of what we've been calling the keys to wholesale generally also really apply to trade shows, and and I think a lot of what you've been talking to speaks to that, um, which is that you can really sort of break it down into four categories. You know, to do to do it right, you need to find new partners. You need to optimize your ordinary. You need to eliminate waste and you need to build and maintain trust. And I think, you know, trade shows are, are really good at a lot of those things. Finding new partners, obviously, if you're wandering around a convention center, letting chance encounters happen, um, you know, that's, that's hugely important towards, towards growing out your network. Optimizing ordering, again, clearly, I think if you're in, you know, one of the biggest challenges with wholesale ordering, I think, in general, and, and wholesale relationships across the board, is, is the very simple and banal reality of inventory management. <clears throat> and the fact that it's just very, very hard when some items are being, you know, fit, you're, you're taking pre-orders so you can determine how much you're going to make. And if it doesn't reach a certain threshold, then that doesn't get made. And then a substitution needs to be made. There's, it's very, very hard to find a substitute for just direct real-time personal communication with the people who are making the decisions. Um, eliminating waste, again, you know, this, looking at that graph, like that's, it, it, there's a lot of fat on that bone in terms of what you're <laughs> spending to be at a trade show. Um, but, you know, it, it's, that gets amortized across hundreds, if not thousands of, of brands and retailers that you're meeting with. So that's, that's why I think they've still maintained their popularity, um, you know, especially in the apparel and home goods world. Um, and finally, building and maintaining trust, which is just what we've been talking about forever. That, you know, when so much of this business happens over email and over, you know, sometimes passive aggressively scrawled notes on invoices and, and text messages and all the rest, it is, it is crucial to have these connections with people so that they're not just, you know, they're not just these, these faceless names in the void, but rather they're people and they're people that you know, and they're people that you've been seeing for years. Yeah. And on, on, on top of that, um, building and maintaining trust at the core of that is being transparent. And if your tools don't support that, you know, if it's, if you're just shooting off an email into the void and hoping for the best that things turn out okay, um, then you're gonna, that trust is gonna break down at some point. Um, and the more frequently that it does, the more it's gonna cost you because those reorders, that's gonna be the lifeblood of your business and it's gonna be, that, that's gonna equate to growth. Um, and I see, you know, this is gonna be a difficult time for everybody. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible. Um, and it's also an opportunity in certain ways for us all to improve the way that we do business and to create new ways that to plant the old. Um, sometimes there are good reasons that things pass by the wayside. And I think that this is an opportunity uh, to get the middlemen out of the system um, and try and keep as much of the profit as we possibly can in the hands of the people who are actually doing the work, which is going to be the brands and the retailers and connecting them, making sure that everything's uh, coherent, happy, and the relationships stay strong. Totally agree. Um, I'm looking at our Facebook stream. We have a question from Rita from Union Rose. Um, hi, Rita. It's, it's very specific and a good one. Um, Rita asks, what if brands were able to send us samples, then we could get hand feel and better knowledge of products. Like brands keep our credit card on file to charge if we don't return samples. Um, it's so important to me to test merchandise, touch fabrics before ordering. I think that's a really good point. That's something we haven't talked about, but there's, that is something that is very hard, if not impossible to simulate digitally. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a really, that's an extremely good, uh, good observation. And it's one of the things that's different about 
in person that you just you, you can't do digitally. Um, the way that a, uh, you know, a garment drapes, um, the hand of the fabric, it all really, it changes what it, you know, what it's worth. It changes who's going to want it. It changes um, how people are going to interact with it. And when they put it on, if they're trying some things on your retail store, for instance, um, whether or not they, that turns into a sale. Um, one of the things that we've started to, to work on here is making sure that there's ways that you can do essentially digital um, digital appointments so that folks can actually make a video of, of the way that the product is actually worn. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing kind of how digital can can integrate um, with this kind of functionality. Now in, in Candid, um, we're actively building out functionality to do sample support specifically, um, but there are some pretty convenient workarounds also um, so that brands can essentially uh, create uh, free products, but manage all the tracking and all that stuff um, and create separate shipments so that they're not um, getting bogged down in it, along with the product that you're actually ordering. So there, there are some pretty convenient ways to do it in Candid and we're looking to improve that quite a bit uh, in the future also, because I think that, you know, I don't know what, what the what distance shopping is. <laughs> I don't know, it's so the version of wholesale that's social distancing. Um, is going to necessitate, um, you know, being able to see and feel the fabrics, um, see and feel the, you know, the way things drape, uh, how heavy they are in the hand, but also support um, the fact that you can't do that in person, which is weird. Yeah, no, it's Great. it's fun. I've, I've been waiting since I was seven years old for virtual reality to finally take off, and I, I feel like it's. <laughs> It's still just not happening. It no, still just, it just it still just doesn't do the thing. We also did no. a video of the guy playing virtual pool who <clears throat> leans forward and falls through the table. That's <laughs> that's just not going to work in a in a sample environment. Okay. Well, uh, honestly, that that goes through my list of questions. I think uh, if anyone else has anything that they'd like to ask, feel free to to chime in on Facebook. Otherwise, I think the prognosis is that you know. Trade shows are what they are. They're they're the only thing worse than trade shows is no trade shows. I think. Um, and now that we're being faced with that reality, um, you know, there are a lot of efforts already underway, including Candid, that are are taking this opportunity to really grow into their their final potential. And um, it is it is fascinating. I think it's it's not it's not the way I would have wanted to do this, but by being forced to throw out trade shows for quite some time, it's it's really forcing, I think, and, and going to result in a lot of innovation faster and sooner than it would have happened otherwise. Yep. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. All right, well, Avery Bloom from Candid Wholesale, thank you for joining me here on Candid Wholesale's yep. Candid Shop Talks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we do these every week for for anyone who's who's just tuning in or seeing a recording of this later. Um, every Wednesday around lunchtime, we we get together and we have guest speakers. We have open discussions. We have panels um, talking about the the issues that concern you. Right now, it's very very focused on coronavirus, but we're we're here for the long haul. We've been here for a while. We will we're planning on being here for a while. Um, as as a, a, you know, right now it, it's just very important for us to all come together and as much as we can. Um, and not just sort of exchange empty platitudes about how we're being here for each other, but actually sharing the tips, the tricks, the strategies, and the ideas that are working, the things that aren't working, and, you know, creating the community that we suddenly can't participate in in real life. So yep. thanks for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Yeah, stay safe out there. You too.